The occupation of the Jordan Valley by the Egyptian Expeditionary Force began in February 1918 during the Sinai and Palestine campaign of World War I. After the capture of Jericho in February the Auckland Mounted Rifle Regiment began patrolling an area of the Jordan Valley near Jericho at the base of the road from Jerusalem. Towards the end of March the first Transjordan attack on Amman and the first Battle of Amman were launched from the Jordan Valley followed a few weeks later by the equally unsuccessful second Transjordan attack on Shunet Nimrin and Esalt at the end of April. During this time the occupation of the Jordan was fully established and continued through the summer of 1918. The occupation ended in September with the Battle of Megiddo which consisted of the Battle of Sharon and the Battle of Nablus. The third Transjordan attack and second Battle of Amman were fought as part of the Battle of Nablus. Despite the difficult climate and the unhealthy environment of the Jordan Valley, General Edmund Allenby decided that, to ensure the strength of the EEF's front line it was necessary to extend the line which stretched from the Mediterranean, across the Judean hills to the Dead Sea to protect his right flank. This line was held until September, providing a strong position from which to launch the attacks on Amman to the east and northwards to Damascus. During the period from March to September the Ottoman army held the hills of Moab on the eastern side of the valley and the northern section of valley. Their well-placed artillery periodically shelled the occupying force and, particularly in May, German aircraft bombed and strafed bivouacs and horse lines. As a consequence of the major victory at Megiddo the occupied area was consolidated with other former Ottoman Empire territories won during the battle. Background After the capture of Jerusalem at the end of 1917 the Jordan River was crossed by infantry and mounted riflemen and bridgeheads established at the beginning of the unsuccessful first Transjordan attack on Amman in March. The defeat of the second Transjordan attack on Shunet Nimrin and Esalt and the withdrawal to the Jordan Valley on 3 to the 5th of May marked the end of major operations until September 1918. The focus shifted to the German Spring offensive launched by Ludendorff on the Western Front which began the same day as the first Transjordan attack on Oman, completely eclipsing its failure. The British front in Picardy held by 300,000 soldiers collapsed when powerful assaults were launched on both sides of the Somme by a force of 750,000, forcing Gough's 5th Army back almost to Amiens. On one day, the 23rd of March German forces advanced 12 miles and captured 600 guns. In total, 1,000 guns and 160,000 suffered the worst defeat of the war. The British War Cabinet recognized at once that the overthrow of the Ottoman Empire must be at least postponed. The effect of this offensive on the Palestine campaign was described by Allen beyond the 1st of April 1918. Here, I have raided the Hejaz Railway 40 miles east of Jordan and have done much damage but my little show dwindles now into a very insufficient, insignificant affair in comparison with events in Europe. Overnight Palestine went from being the British government's first priority to a side show decision to occupy the valley. Reasons for garrisoning the Jordan Valley include the road from the Hejaz Railway Station at Haman to Shanet. Nimrin opposite the Goria crossing of the Jordan River, remained a serious strategic threat to the British right flank as a large German and Ottoman force could very quickly be moved from Amman to Shunet. Nimrin and a major attack mounted into the valley. The plan for the advance in September required holding the Jordan bridgeheads and maintaining a continuous threat of another offensive across the Transjordan. The mobility of the mounted force kept alive the possibility of a third Transjordan attack on this flank and their endurance of the terrible heat may have confirmed the enemy's assumption that the next advance would come in this sector of the front line. The implied threat of a large mounted force which was constantly active in whatever part of the front line desert mounted corps was based raised enemy expectations of a fresh attack being mounted in that area. 
a withdrawal of Lieutenant General Harry Chauvel's force from the valley to the heights may have been contemplated but the lost territory would have to be retaken before the proposed September operations. Despite the huge numbers of sick projected to be suffered during the occupation of the Jordan Valley, the retaking of the valley may have been more costly than holding it. If a retreat out of the Jordan Valley took place, the alternative position in the wilderness overlooking the Jordan Valley was insufficient in either space or water to accommodate the desert-mounted core. A retreat out of the valley would enhance the already increased morale of the German and Ottoman forces and their standing in the region. Following the Trans-Jordan victories, Normally mounted troops would be held in reserve, but Allenby did not think there were enough available infantry divisions to hold his front line while the radical reorganization of the Egyptian expeditionary force was being carried out. It therefore was decided to defend the eastern flank from the Jordan Valley with a strong garrison until September and to occupy a place many considered to be an unpleasant and unhealthy place and virtually uninhabitable during the hot summer months due to the heat, high humidity and malaria. So important was the support of Prince Faisal's Sheriff al Hejaz Arab force to the defense of the EEF's right flank, that they were substantially subsidized by the War Office. After a delay in receipt of the payment, the High Commissioner in Egypt Reginald Wingate wrote to Allenby on 5 July 1918, I think we shall manage the subsidy required as well as the extra £50,000 you require for northern operations. At the time £400,000 was on its way from Australia. While Wingate was asking the War Office for an additional £500,000, Emphasizing the importance of the regular payment of our Arab subsidy, the Ottoman defenders maintained an observation post on El Horde Hill which dominates the whole Jordan Valley. At this time the strength was estimated at 68,000 rifles and sabers and morale of the Ottoman defenders very strong, the harvest coming in and food abundant, while the EEF was defending its line with every available unit. As Allenby wrote in a letter to the War Office on 15 June 1918, all my goods are in the shop window. The 60 miles EEF line stretching from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River was strong, supported by roads and communications behind. However, the line was wide in comparison with the size of the EEF it. Allenby saying, it is the best line I can hold. Any retirement would weaken it. My right flank is covered by the Jordan, my left by the Mediterranean Sea. The Jordan Valley must be held by me, it is vital. If the Turks regained control of the Jordan, I should lose control of the Dead Sea. This would cut me off from the Arabs on the Hejaz Railway, with the result that, shortly, the Turks would regain the power in the Hejaz. The Arabs would make terms with them, and our prestige would be gone. My right flank would be turned, and my position in Palestine would be untenable. I might hold Rafa or Awarish, but you can imagine what effect such a withdrawal would have on the population of Egypt, and on the watching tribes of the Western Desert. You see, therefore, that I cannot modify my present dispositions. I must give up nothing of what I now hold. Anyhow, I must hold the Jordan Valley. Garrison Chauvel was given the task of defending the Jordan Valley, but his Desert Mounted Corps had lost the 5th Mounted Brigade and the Yeomanry Mounted Division, both of which, along with most of the British infantry, were sent to the Western Front to be replaced by Indian Army infantry and cavalry. This resultant reorganization required time to work through. The Jordan Valley was garrisoned in 1918 by the 20th Indian Brigade, the Anzac Mounted Division and the Australian Mounted Division, until 17 May when the 4th and 5th Cavalry Divisions arrived. They took over the outposts in the sector outside the Gororia Bridgehead while the 15th Cavalry Brigade held the bridgehead. In August these troops were joined at the beginning of the month by the newly formed 1st and 2nd Battalions British West Indies Regiment, in the middle of the month by the 38th Battalion Royal Fusiliers. 
both part of the Jewish Legion and towards the end of August by British Indian Army cavalry units. This force included a section of the Light Armoured Motor Brigade commanded by Captain McIntyre. The armoured cars had two machine guns mounted on the rear of each car and were camouflaged with bushes while making sorties to attack Ottoman patrols. Allenby had decided to hold the valley with this mainly mounted force because the mobility of mounted troops would enable them to keep the greater proportion of their strength in reserve on the higher ground. Chauvel's headquarters were at Talat Eddam from 25 April until 16 September and he divided the Jordan Valley into two sectors, each patrolled by three brigades while a reserve of three brigades was maintained. In the garrisoned area of the valley there were two villages, Jericho and Iujml Bar on the edge of the Dead Sea. Other human habitations included the Bedouin shelters and several monasteries. Arabs chose to evacuate Jericho during the summer months, leaving only the heterogeneous local tribes. In the vicinity of the Dead Sea, the Tamara, a 7,000-strong semi-settled Arab tribe cultivated selected areas of the slopes of the Dead Sea about Wadi Mualak and Wadi Nur. They husbanded 3,000 sheep, 2,000 donkeys and a few large cattle or camels and traveled to the Madabai district to work as hired carriers. Conditions in the valley at 1,290 feet below sea level and 4,000 feet below the mountains on either side of the scorching Jordan Valley. Here for weeks at a time, the shade temperature rarely dropped below 100 degrees Fahrenheit and occasionally reached 122 to 125 degrees Fahrenheit. At the Gororia bridgehead 130 degrees Fahrenheit was recorded. Coupled with the heat, the tremendous evaporation of the Dead Sea which keeps the still, heavy atmosphere moist, adds to the discomfort and produces a feeling of lassitude which is most depressing and difficult to overcome. In addition to these unpleasant conditions the valley swarms with snakes, scorpions, mosquitoes, great black spiders and men and animals were tormented by day and night by swarms of every sort of fly. Trooper R. W. Gregson 2663 described the Jordan Valley to his family, It's a terrible place. I will never tell anyone to go to hell again. I will tell him to go to Jericho, and I think that will be bad enough. From Jericho the Jordan River was invisible, about four miles across the almost open plain, being very good going for movement across the valley. Big vultures perch on the chalky bluffs overlooking the river, and storks are seen flying overhead, while wild pigs were seen in the bush. The river contained many fish, and its marshy borders were crowded with frogs and other small animals. In the spring the land in the Jordan Valley supports a little thin grass, but the fierce sun of early summer quickly scorches this leaving only a layer of white chalky marl impregnated with salt, several feet deep. This surface was soon broken up by the movement of mounted troops into a fine white powder resembling flour, and covering everything with a thick blanket of dust. Roads and tracks were often covered with as much as one foot of white powder and traffic stirred this up into a dense, limey cloud which penetrated everywhere, and stuck grittily to sweat-soaked clothes. A white coating of dust wood and shroud men returning from watering their horses, their clothes, wet with perspiration which sometimes dripped from the knees of their riding breeches, and their faces only revealed by sweaty rivulets. During the summer the nights are breathless, but in the early morning a strong hot wind, blowing from the north, sweeps the white dust down the valley in dense choking clouds. By about 1100 the wine dies down, and a period of death-like stillness follows, accompanied by intense heat. Shortly afterwards a wind sometimes arises from the south, or violent air currents sweep the valley, carrying dust devils to great heights. These continue till about 2200 after which sleep is possible for a few brief hours. The troops' general careworn appearance was very noticeable. They were not actually ill but lacked proper sleep and the effects of this deprivation were intensified by the heat. 
dust, humidity, pressure effect, stillness of the air, and mosquitoes which together with the cumulative effects of the hardships of the two previous years of campaigning caused a general depression. These extremely depressing effects of the region in turn contributed to the debility of troops after a period in the valley. Their shelter was most often just bivouac sheets which barely allowed the men room to sit up. There were a few bell tents in which temperatures reached 125 degrees Fahrenheit. However, although they worked long hours in the hot sun patrolling, digging, wiring, caring for the horses and carrying out anti-mosquito work, heat exhaustion was never a problem as there was easy access to large supplies of pure cool water for drinking and washing. Springs supplied drinking water and supplies of rations and forage were transported to the valley from Jerusalem. But thirst was constant and very large quantities of fluid, more than one imperial gallon were consumed, while meat rations consisted mainly of tins of bully beef, which was often stewed by the hot conditions while still in the cans, and bread was always dry and there were few fresh vegetables. Vegetation the bush ranged from four feet to the height of a horse. There were numerous bur trees which have enormous thorns and big prickly bushes, which made it quite easy to rig up shelter from the sun. And near Jericho a woody scrub three to four feet high, with broad leaves which are woolly on the underside, has fruit similar to apples. There was dense Jehau jungle on either side of the Jordan River for some 200 to 300 yards and the banks were sheer about five to six feet above water level which made it impossible to swim horses in the river. Swimming in the Dead Sea while in bivouac in the Jordan Valley, it was a common practice when things were quiet, for soldiers to ride the few miles to Rujml Bar at the northern end of the Dead Sea where the Jordan River runs in, to bathe themselves and their horses. This inland sea is about 47 miles long and about 10 miles wide with steep mountain country sloping down to the water on each side. The surface of the sea lies 1,290 feet below the sea level of the Mediterranean and the water is extremely salty, containing about 25% mineral salts and is extremely buoyant. Many of the horses were obviously perplexed at floating so high out of the water. It has been calculated that 6,500,000 tons of water fall into the Dead Sea daily from various streams. And as the sea has no outlet all of this water evaporates creating the humid heat of the atmosphere in the valley. There were also opportunities to swim in the Jordan River. Water supply and mosquitoes The one generous feature of the valley was its water supply. The slightly muddy Jordan River flowed strongly throughout the year in a trough about 100 to 150 feet below the valley floor, fed by numerous clear springs and wadis running into it on either side. Most New Zealanders enjoyed the physical benefits of bathing in the Jordan at one time or another during the campaign in which a good bath was such a luxury. In the left sector where the Australian Mounted Division was stationed there were several sources of water, the Jordan River, the Wadi El Aya, and the Wadi New Amer, which flowed from Ain El Duck and into the Jordan at El Goraria. The latter wadi was used by the headquarters of the valley defences. The section of the valley patrolled by the Anzac Mounted Division was crossed by the Wadis Aya, Melaha, New Amer and the Kelt as well as the Jordan River with several extensive marshes in the jungle on its banks. The nullahs were astonishingly deep, usually with dense vegetation and quite big trees. The area was notorious for subtition or malignant malaria and in particular the whole valley of the Wadi El Melaha was swarming with anapholes, larvae, the worst kind of mosquitoes. A thousand men cut down the jungle, drained the marshes and swamps, the streams were cleared of reds which were burnt. Canals created so there was no opportunity for standing water, holes were filled in, stagnant pools were oiled and hard standings for the horses were constructed. Even a cultivated area at the source of the Anes Sultan was treated by 600 members of the Egyptian Labour Corps over a period of two months. 
No breeding of the larvae could be demonstrated three days after the work was complete but the areas had to be continually maintained by special malarial squads of the sanitary section and the Indian Infantry Brigade. These measures were successful as during the six months to September the incidence of malaria in Chauvel's force was just over 5% with most cases occurring on the front line or in no man's land, while incidence of malaria in the reserve areas was very low. However, despite all efforts, Cases of malaria were reported during May and reports of fever steadily developed as the heat and dust increased and the men became less physically fit which lowered their ability to resist sickness. In addition to malaria, minor maladies became very common. Thousands of men suffered from blood diseases known as sandfly fever and five-day fever, which manifested in excessive temperatures, followed by temporary prostration, and few escaped severe stomach disorders. Conditions for the horses The climate did not affect the horses in a marked way but their rations, although plentiful contained only a small proportion of pure grain with insufficient nutritional value and was too bulky and unpalatable, while others thought the forage was all that could be desired and water was plentiful and good. During midsummer when iron was too hot to handle and a hand placed on the back of a horse was positively painful, yet in the dust. The heat and the many diseases, in particular Sura fever which carried by the Sura fly which, in 1917 decimated the Ottoman transport killing as many as 42,000 camels in the Jordan Valley. The horses survived. They did not thrive, however, and they came out of the valley in poor condition, due mainly due to insufficient number of men to water, feed and groom them and the conditions were unfavorable for exercise, which is essential for keeping horses in good health and condition. There was on average one man to look after six or seven horses, and at times in some regiments there was only one man for every 15 horses after the daily sick had been evacuated and men for outposts. Patrols and anti-malarial work had been found.